You're listening to Summer in the School of Faith, a sermon series about discovering the foundations of our faith. For more information about First Baptist Startville, please visit www.fbcstartville.com. If you have your Bible, please join me in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and today we'll look at verses 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20. One of my favorite sculptures, one of my favorite pieces of art is Michelangelo's Moses. Have you ever seen that? This beautiful sculpture shows Moses with a long flowing beard. He's clutching the tablets of stone bearing the Ten Commandments. His hair is, uh, his head there is crowned with the glory of God. Every detail in that sculpture just stands out. Even the veins, if you could get close enough, Even the veins on the hands of Moses, Michelangelo took care for every detail. And to think that this masterpiece is all from a piece of stone. Some have said that that sculpture, completed in the year 1515, 1515, is unequaled by any modern ancient work. And Michelangelo, in his own words, this is what he said, Every block of stone has a statue inside of it. It's up to the sculpture to discover it. Every block of stone has a statue inside of it. It's up to the sculptor to discover it. So today we're looking at the fourth word in our study of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. Verse number 8 is where we'll find the fourth word. Listen to it. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The fourth word of the Lord. But notice something about that particular commandment. Notice that the words that uh, come before it, as well as the words that come after it, The words around these two words, the fourth word and the fifth word, the next one in verse 12, honor your father and mother, the words around all of those two words are bound together by the word no or not. So, for example, verse 1, no other gods, or the first commandment, no other gods. The second commandment, don't make a carved image. The third commandment, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. The sixth commandment, not to murder, the seventh commandment, not to commit adultery, the eighth commandment, not to steal, the ninth commandment, not to bear false witness, and of course the tenth commandment, not to covet. But the fourth and the fifth word tells us what to do. It tells us to remember, keep, and honor. Remember, keep, and and honor. Now, these two words are at the heart of the list of the Ten Commandments. And notice what's particular about them. It doesn't tell us, don't do this. It tells us positively to do something. And so, these two words, the fourth and the fifth word, right at the heart of the Ten Commandments, really give us a clue about what the Ten Commandments is all about. And some are wondering, is the Ten Commandments, does it have any bearing on our everyday life? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, not to replace it, but to fulfill it. So the question that we then are always, I'm always doing this, every sermon, I'm always showing you how Jesus fulfills the Ten Commandments and how we are fulfilling the Ten Commandments by our faith in Him. But these fourth and fifth words, they tell us what the Ten Commandments are all about. And these ten words are forming, or we should say conforming us, into the image that God delights in. 
Remember who God is. He's our creator. So we are being fashioned and formed by his word into an image that delights him. I love the words of Peter Lightheart. This is what he says. These two words are at the heart of the ten words. They reveal. These two words reveal what's left. When idolatry, hypocrisy, violence, infidelity, theft, and lies have been chiseled away. What's left? Lightheart asks. Rest, joy, and harmony amongst generations. Rest, joy, and harmony among generations. Rest. That's the word that our Lord is calling our to attention to today. And God, think about this. God, our God, commands you to rest. Now, some of you today, you really need to hear that. I know I need to hear that. We all need to hear that. God, this God, your God that loves you, that cares for you, He tells you, commands you to take it easy. But not just take it easy, to rest. And what a word God has today for our wearied society. You know, in 1879, I know that's a long time, none of you remember that, but in 1879, Thomas Edison uh, patented the light bulb. 1879, he patented the light bulb. And our world has not been the same ever since. Edison, when he patented that light bulb, it was the modern day equivalent to let there be light. And Edison invited humanity, invited the whole world into a world that never sleeps. And did you know that Thomas Edison himself is recorded, and I'm going to give you a quote in a minute, but Edison, he thought that sleep was a waste of time. Now, some of you would say that you have trouble going to sleep. I know I have a friend who says that he has trouble going to sleep because he just can't quit thinking. I have never in my life had that trouble. I don't have any trouble going to sleep. Matter of fact, my wife, she gets on to me because of this. Uh, she'll be talking, and then she'll hear me start making noises, obviously indicating that I'm not saying yes to her, indicating that I'm already in la-la land, and she's trying to carry on a conversation. I don't have any trouble going to sleep. But Thomas Edison, he invited the whole world, and he invited humanity into a, uh, into a world that never sleeps. Here's what Edison said. Listen to this. There is really no reason that men should go to bed at all. Really? Thomas? How'd that go for you about 4 o'clock? Who knows? But anyway, Thomas Edison said that there is really no reason why men should go to bed at all. And it really seems that many have bought into Edison's philosophy. We are busier as a society than ever. Matter of fact, some of you, you have this. If you have an Apple Watch like I do, you can pair it with your Apple phone, and you can have an app that will tell you when to go to sleep (laughs) and when to get up. We don't even, we have to be reminded when to go to bed, and then it'll tell us how well we slept. And the fourth word comes at us right from God, and it confronts the chaos of our world with a word, and the word is rest. The word is rest. And so today, what I want to do with you this morning is I want to consider what the Bible says about rest. So here's how you rest this morning. Three truths to show you how to rest. Number one, remember creation. Number one, remember creation. I want you to notice how it grounds, how the fourth word grounds what it's telling us to do. Look at the Bible. Look at the text. Look how the Bible grounds everything that it's telling us to do. It says in verse 8, here's, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And then verse 10, the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord. Don't work on it. Not any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, female servant, any livestock sojourner, And then, and look at how it's all grounded. Look at verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven 
and earth, the sea, and all that's in them rested on the seventh day. And then here it is, therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So we're seeing a pattern here already developed or developing in these ten words that this is now the second time, at least the second time, that God has taken us back to creation. God wants us to remember something. As we consider these words, as some of them sound strange, some of them in particularly today, the fourth word, where we're uh, confronted with a society that doesn't value rest, where we're confronted with a society that doesn't value coming together and gathering like you have here this morning. The Lord God is confronting our sensibilities, and the way that He confronts our sensibilities is, is sensibilities is He says, remember, I am the Creator, you're the creature. Now, I know some of you don't like to be called a creature, but I didn't call you a creature. God called you a creature. Matter of fact, you are His creature, and He loves you, and He wants what's best for you. God wants us to remember that He is our Creator, and we are His creatures. Now, why would God want us to remember again and again? Why would He want to remind us again and again of creation? Here's the reason, I believe, because when you and I can answer the question of origin, that is, where did I come from? There's a next question. If we can answer that question, and everyone answers that question, no matter what answer they give, everyone answers that question, where did I come from? And after you've answered that question, there's another question that follows logically from it. What am I here for? Or what's my purpose? And if, follow with me, if as some evolutionists suggest, were the consequences of chance, then the second question of purpose is harder for us to get a handle on. If there is no purpose for your existence from the beginning, if there is no purpose to your existence from the beginning, then you are liable, listen, to be cast adrift in a large sea called no purpose. We have a lot of people in our society that they have rejected God as their creator. What on earth, what is my origin? Where did I come from? Because they don't get that question right, then the question, the second question, what am I here for? What's my purpose? Can't be answered. And so they're lost. Lost. Does that term sound familiar? They're lost. Lost in a sea of relativism. Lost in a sea of no purpose. I remember back when Facebook asked for religious views. I don't know if Facebook still asks for religious views, but back they used to ask for religious views. I had a a friend. She put a video of a plastic bag being blown about by the wind. What was her religious views? She had a link to a video that showed a bag, a plastic bag, being blown about by the wind here and there. At one point in the video, it got stuck on a pole. The wind was blowing it this direction, and the bag wasn't getting anywhere. And then the bag had to wait until the wind blew in another direction, and then it was set free. And this was her view of life. No purpose, just like a plastic bag in the breeze. And there are so many folks that have this view. Maybe you wouldn't say it out loud, but so many have this view deep down in their heart. They'd never admit to having such a haphazard view, of, but they have it in their minds. Because in their minds and in their hearts, they have unmoored themselves from the thought of God. And so they're adrift. They're lost. In our society... Humanity has forgotten God, and so have forgotten themselves. And both of those things are true. If you don't know who God is, you can never know who you are. Because like it or not, and this is what's so challenging, so confrontational, 
about our Christian confession. The Bible starts out by saying, in the beginning, God created. You know what that means? It means that this is not just the story for us who believe. This is the true story of the whole world. Like it or not, men and women, boys and girls who forget God inevitably inevitably have forgotten themselves. And this was the entire point made by Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he received the Templeton Prize back in 1983. The name of his acceptance speech was, listen to this, Men Have Forgotten God. And Solzhenitsyn, he was an Orthodox Christian, if you remember, an Orthodox Christian who resisted communism. And let me read to you what he says about the spirit of the age that he knew. It was an age of atheism, a society that denied God. Listen to Solzhenitsyn. Listen to what he says. He says, men have forgotten God. The failings of human consciousness, deprived of its divine dimensions, have been a determining factor in all the major crimes of this century. The first of these was World War I, and much of our present predicament can be tracked or traced back to it. It was a war, the memory of which seems to be fading, when Europe, bursting with health and abundance, fell into a rage of self-mutilation which could not but sap its strength for a century or more and perhaps forever. The only possible explanation for this war is mental eclipse among the leaders of Europe due to their lost awareness of a supreme power above them. Listen to Solzhenitsyn. Only a godless embitterment could have moved ostensibly Christian states to employ poison gas, a weapon so obviously beyond the limits of humanity. Men have forgotten God, and so have forgotten themselves. And then Solzhenitsyn draws these startling conclusions about the spirit of our age. Listen to what he says. Faced with cannibalism, our godless age has discovered the perfect anesthetic, trade, trade. Such is the pathetic pinnacle of contemporary wisdom. And then he says this, yet we have grown used to this kind of world and we even feel at home in it. And all of these commandments that we're considering, listen, all of these commandments that we're considering, they're not just articles to be etched in stone and adorned on our walls as tapestries of art. These are the ten words of God that demonstrate God's design for life at its best. If He's the Creator, If He designed us, then He's the only one qualified to tell us how to live. And if you and I buck against this, then listen, we're bucking up against our own design. We're bucking up against God. These are the ten words, and these words tell us how to live, tell us what's right, and tell us that anything you can try to add this or patch this or put this in, but it's not going to fit because you weren't made for it. God writes a word for us. And what's He say right in the beginning? He says, you are created. And a strong way to remember that we're created, listen, is to keep the Sabbath holy, which is our second point this morning. Number two, we have to make rest a priority. We have to make rest a priority. You're not going to drift towards rest this morning. You're going to drift away from it. You won't drift towards what's good. A church never will. Individuals never will. I never will. We'll always drift away from what is good. Even into activities, we'll drift even into activities that offer the false facade of rest. And so when God calls for is our resting, He calls us to recognize that He is Lord and Creator. And look at the text. The rest that He's calling for is for us to set aside a day that's so 
countercultural. It only makes sense to believers. Now, I don't mean to trivialize this point this morning. I don't mean to trivialize this point. What I want to do is I want to teach you this point as clearly and as compassionately as I know how. Listen to the preacher. This commandment right here is one of the reasons we come to church on Sunday. We come to church when the rest of our society is sleeping in. We come to church when the rest of our society, listen, is choosing work. I want to give a caveat there lest we drip into legalism. Some of you have to work. I understand that. But there's a difference between having to work and choosing to work. We come to church when the world systems tell us, instead of coming to church, do something else, like maybe go to a ball game. We choose a company of worshipers over a crowded stadium, over a golf group, over a deer stand, over John and his boat, over a warm and comfy bed, over breakfast sometimes. And some of you say, well, this is really perfect, man. This is so great. Here, this is this new pastor. This is super, super regional weekend. You're pastoring this brand new church here in the heart of Mississippi State University. And of all Sundays, of all the topics, of all the days when the game really matters most, it's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Quit meddling. But you know what it sounds like to me? And I didn't design this. I didn't know Mississippi State was going to make it this far. This is the word of the Lord for us today. You know what it is? Listen, beloved. And I realize I'm preaching to the choir, but that's okay. You can go and tell other members who aren't in the choir. What is our Lord's word today? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And God has arranged these particular set of circumstances when the Catholics are in town and we're playing super regionals for us to remember. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And it's my prayer that you this morning are listening. A few weeks ago, I mentioned Eric Liddell. Liddell is one of the most famous Christian athletes of all time. His nickname was the Flying Scotsman. He won a gold medal in the 400 meter, and he was in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, and he was favored to win the 100 meters. Matter of fact, he had the best qualifying time. No one came close to touching him. Eric Liddell, if you want to see his story, you can watch the movie Chariots of Fire. But you know what he refused to do? Even though he was favored, he refused to run the race because the race was held on Sunday. Now, Eric Liddell is what many would call a Sabbatarian, and I'm not a Sabbatarian. I'm not calling for you to be a Sabbatarian. I can remember uh, my associate pastor in my first church. I invited him over to my house, and then I invited him to help me wash my car on Sunday afternoon, and he just couldn't believe that I was going to wash my car on Sunday afternoon, and I said, why not, man? Come on. I'm not a Sabbatarian. I'm not calling you to be a Sabbatarian. Some would say that maybe Eric Liddell took it too far, but then again, maybe we aren't taking it far enough. There's an increasing pressure upon you as a believer on all angles not to come, not to set aside a moment to rest and to remember your Creator. You know, before the pandemic, church attendance was estimated to be an average of twice a month. Before the pandemic, church attendance was estimated to be at an average of twice a month. In other words, most people only come to church two out of the four Sundays. But now, after the pandemic, after the pandemic, the report suggests that people are only going to come one time. A month. And the question that I just humbly ask, as compassionately but with as much conviction as I know how, from my position, one who obviously believes in the importance of church, what are people doing those other three Sundays? 
And furthermore, what will the world do when they see us not valuing setting aside to come and worship? We think that the only change that we can have in a society is by taking a vote to the ballot box? Don't be hypocritical. Don't say that you believe in Christian values and you want this country to be right when you don't even value it enough to get up on Sunday and do what the church has been doing for 2,000 years and come to church. What are people doing is the honest question that I have. What's the message that we're giving to our society? Listen, Christian confession isn't just something that you say that you believe. Christian confession is what we do. And one of our best chances, it's not everything, but one of our best chances to do it right is when we meet to worship. We go to church. A song we used to sing used to emphasize the importance of church. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the Word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray, and holy manna will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming. Hell is moving. Can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray, and holy manna will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' his sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray, and holy manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. When we gather to worship, we come together as a foretaste, a dress rehearsal, of what it's going to be like in glory. And my question is, is church used to be something that we all used to look forward to going to, not forward to look and come to get it out of the way so that we can go to something else. But now, what message are we saying to ourselves and our own hearts if we would rather do something else than be with God's people? gathered around together. Now, some of you have already pegged me already, and you've said you're being too reductionistic. You're looking at this fourth word, and you're saying that it's about church. It's not about coming to church. And I want to say to you, you're absolutely right. It is so much more robust than that. But here's what I want to also tell you, that if you won't even make church a priority over other things, then you won't learn the rest of what it means to keep the Sabbath day holy. You see, here's my, here's what I know this morning. God knows your heart. I don't know your heart. But my question is, are you remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy? When we come to church, we are telling the world that there is more than commerce. There is more than than sports. There is more than this so-called leisure. There is rest available. And it is a rest. Listen, it is a rest that comes through redemption. Don't miss that. It's a rest that comes through redemption. You see, this is why it's so important, and this is why I almost wanted to avoid a message like this. Not because I was afraid to tell you this on Super Bulldog Weekend or whatever it is, Super Regional Weekend. The reason that I was afraid to say this is because I think that in your heart, you're prone towards idolatry. You're prone to, I'm prone to legalism. I don't want to guilt you into coming to church. I don't think I could do it anyway. Oh, to God that He would put in your heart a desire to be gathered when the people 
of God are gathered. Number three this morning, and this is the most important point. Write this down, please. Rest in redemption. Number three, rest in redemption. When we rest from our labor, when we cease from things, we make a loud statement with our actions that we depend upon God for all things. You know why this commandment is hard? It's hard because it calls us to action as it's calling us to rest. It calls us to action as it's calling us to rest. It's hard for us to stop. It's hard for us to balance. But this word, like all the other words, are calling us to be a distinct people, a people of His own possession, a people that He intends to form into His image. It's an image, listen, it's an image of perfection. It's an image of love. It's an image that the world has seen before, but only one time. And one day, the world's going to see that image again. As we close our time together, what I want you to do is I want you to join me. I want to show you this. This is, this is for those of you who've been with me so far, you've made it to the end. We've been spelunking in this cave called Bible study, and all the gold is at the bottom. So you've made it to the bottom of the sermon. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you this. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, and I want to show you something incredible. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, which is, by the way, don't miss this, this is what Exodus chapter 20 in verse 8 through 11 in the fourth word is calling us to do. We're being called to go back to Genesis chapter 1 because he, he called it in our minds. But So go back, Genesis 1. We see God creating. This is what he says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then look at what we have here. Look how many times this word is repeated. God said, let there be an expanse. In verse 7, God made. You see that? He made. He, in verse 18, he, or 16, he made. God is making. And then in verse 26, for example, God, let us, let us make man in our image. And then in verse 31, saw everything that he had made. And then we have our passage this morning. Thus the heavens in chapter 2 of Genesis, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them And on the seventh day, God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day, verse 3, and look at this. Here's the word again. He made it holy because on it God rested from all the work that He had done. Now look at verse 4 of chapter 2. Hopefully you're following along. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, created, that's different, in the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And then notice what happens next in chapter 3. Literally, chapter 3, everything falls apart. But So God's resting from all the work that He's done in chapter 2. He's rested from the work that He's done. He's not making anything else. He's resting. But then look at chapter 3. After the fall, after the curse, after the promise, after the the blessing that He gives upon His humanity, saying that one day a a seed is going to come from the from the uh, uh, a son is going to come from the seed of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. After all of those things, look at what happens. Remember, God's resting. Notice chapter 3 and verse 21. Here it is. And the Lord God, here's the word, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothe them. So God interrupts. Is resting by making. What's he make? He interrupts his rest by making articles of redemption. The rest of God has been interrupted. God's not resting. 
He's making. What's he making? He's making redemption. And down through the ages, all the Bible, I hope this is the way you view the Bible, all down the ages we see God making redemption. He rescues Abraham. He rescues Joseph from the pit. He rescues Jacob from famine. He rescues Israel from Egypt. He rescues Joshua from Canaan. He rescues Israel from the exile. And then Jesus comes. And he is breaking bonds that people didn't even know that they had. He forgives sins. He heals the sick. He causes the blinded eyes to see. He raises the dead. And don't miss this. The garments of his skin, the garments of the skin of Jesus, are torn as his body is hung from a tree. And in that moment, what's he say? Tetelestai. It is finished. What's finished? What is finished? Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working all through the ages. God is working redemption. And then we hear this declaration as the lamb of God's flesh is torn. It is finished. Redemption is finished. Rest is secured for a soul. And that's the message. This is why we come to church. This is the message that we hear each Sunday. Every song, every prayer, every sermon, it is finished. And as long as I am a gospel preacher, as long as I preach, I will have a message for you. And that message to you and the world is because of Jesus. It is finished. So come here every week. Come here every week to the It Is Finished Society. Come to church and rest. Even if you operate the camera, even if you open the door, even if you teach a class, even if you ride the golf cart, even if you volunteer in the nursery, in the harbor ministry, all of that flows From it is finished. The fourth word is rest. And the way to rest is to come to Jesus. Who has said, finally and forever, it is finished. So my question for you simply this morning is, Do you believe that it's finished? Well, then rest in the finished work of Jesus. You say, how do I do that? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Father, what a challenge you give us from your Word. A challenge indeed. When our society pulls us in so many different directions, we're busier now than we have ever been, but we're busier and in some cases going nowhere. Father, help us to do exactly what your Word says, to remember and keep. Father, it's my prayer for someone in this room today who feels guilty. Father, may they know that satisfaction for their souls has been made in Jesus. And they can come to Him, and they will find a word waiting for them. Forgiven. Forgiven. Because it is finished. In Jesus' name, amen.